fuck them. Um, Roxy Koss, Alexa Tarantino, and Brian Carter. Uh, we're going to start out tonight by letting sort of each of them talk to you a little bit about their careers and how they got started um, and share with you some of the experiences they've had. Uh, so let me turn things over first to uh, Roxy. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. So many attendees tonight. That's great. Um, so uh, yeah, so a little bit about my background. We're here tonight to focus on entrepreneurship. Um, and I think, you know, before we can understand how, you know, to make a career and what that even means, we need to understand where we're coming from. So uh, I grew up in Seattle and I um, went to William Patterson University in New Jersey for my undergraduate degree. I got a Bachelor of Music in Jazz Studies um, performance. And I am a saxophonist, composer, band leader, educator, activist. Um, so I currently am the president of the Women in Jazz organization. I was the founder uh, back in 2017. I am on the board of directors for the Jazz Education Network, Jen. I'm on faculty at the Juilliard School in the jazz department. I'm an ensemble coach there. And I am a band leader. As I mentioned, I have um, the Roxy Cost Quintet and we've recorded five albums together. We've toured and um, I do a lot of work as a side musician in many, many different settings. So small group jazz, big band jazz, uh, non-jazz, any, anything you can imagine, uh, basically. And I've also been teaching, you know, private students since I was about 14 and participating in many various educational activities. Um, amongst many other things that we'll probably stumble upon. So that's sort of my background. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, let's turn things over maybe next to um, it's Alexa Tarantino. Hi, everybody. Hope everyone's safe and healthy. Thank you so much, Andy and Jez St. Louis for having us. Um, happy to be back for another session. So. I am from West Hartford, Connecticut originally. Um, I live in New York City and I'm a saxophonist, woodwind doubler, uh, educator, composer, and yeah, just trying to be generally a positive and um, enthusiastic person during COVID. Here we are, everybody, another virtual session. Um, I wish we could see your faces. I really miss seeing people, so I feel like I'm I'm talking at Brian and, and Roxy and Andy. So make sure you get your questions in and let us know how you're doing um, so we can keep this engaging for everybody. So yeah, from West Hartford, Connecticut and uh, been in New York for about five years. I was really fortunate to have grown up in a town that had an amazing public school jazz education program. So even though my parents aren't musicians, I just got the bug from a young age um, and went for it. Um, and I'm really glad that I did. I feel like I, I couldn't have imagined doing anything else with my life. Um, but I was really lucky that, you know, my parents um, also instilled in me like a, a sort of a set of business skills and work ethic and community oriented um, thought. And I think that has been really helpful as Brian and Roxy and I share our experiences. I think that will be the common thread um, for me, the projects that I've been a part of have been uh, the Rockport Jazz Workshop, which is a summer jazz program that I founded in 2014 and have directed since. So we bring jazz education to about 120 students in the Massachusetts area. Um, and I play and tour with a variety of people and teach primarily for jazz at Lincoln Center, but do a lot of guest artist master classes and residencies around the world. So. I think what I'm most excited to hear about you all is kind of where you are looking to go in your careers, how you feel we can help you, especially in the current virtual climate. Um, I think Roxy and Brian and I are all, you know, we've all had to really pivot to be online and we're learning a lot in that respect as well. So happy to be here. Thank you. And, and last but certainly not least, uh, Brian Carter. Thanks, Andy. Hi, everyone. How are you? Um, as Roxy, I'm sorry, as Alexa said, we, uh, we miss seeing everyone's faces. I think we, uh, 
we miss interacting with people. Um, my name is Brian Carter. I am a, a jazz musician, obviously, but I am a vocalist, a drummer, uh, composer, arranger, orchestrator, educator. Um, and most of, of what I do um, consists of, of touring, being a band leader with various projects I have, um, as well as being a, uh, a sideman. So um, I, I, I think I would start primarily with saying that I'm, I, I, I'm a touring musician. I tour about 200 days out of the year. Um, and when I'm, well, I did before the, <laughs> before the end of the world. <laughs> um, uh, but when I'm not touring, um, I am very active and very busy with teaching. Um, I was a founding member, uh, a founding band leader, teaching artist for Jazz, Ellen Considers Jazz for Young People program, um, where we would go into New York City Public Schools. Um, and I've since stepped, a, stepped back a little bit because of my schedule. And I do about, I'd say, 50 to 100 master classes, clinics uh, per year at different schools of all levels, elementary schools, uh, middle schools, high schools, and of course, the university level. Um, I'm involved with the Savannah Music Program. Um, so that's kind of like the, the teaching. I love teaching. Uh, when I'm not doing that, I'm working as a composer uh, for film and television, uh, an arranger and orchestrator. I'm currently orchestrating um, a Broadway show that's coming uh, to Broadway in the fall, hopefully, um, as well as two off-Broadway projects that are going to premiere. One premieres in London, hopefully, in the fall, and one will premiere early 2022 in London. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much uh, what I do. But it, we, I think that all three of us, four if you include Andy, we all have um, very diverse backgrounds. Um, I think it's now more important than ever to diversify yourself as a musician. Um, outside of music, I, I work as a vlogger, as a presenter uh, on television. Um, I work on television as a musician. Um, I was on a television show called Maya and Marty, and I work as a music director. I've arranged and music directed from gospel artists like Anita Wilson, who's from St. Louis, what's up, uh, to uh, you know Nick Jonas, or you know, pot, the number one podcast right now and, and dating podcasts. Uh, so like, there's all different sorts of work that you can get into. Um, just from your just from your home uh, when you're not on the road or from the airplane when you are on the road so sort of continuing along with with sort of your stories and your personal experiences I was I was curious if there was a you know sort of how you transitioned out of you know I know this can be a big overlap but transitioning out of like the college time to more of a professional career getting out you know uh, away from the university setting and and making a, a living for yourself? I'll, I'll jump in first again. Definitely a great question. And I think not only probably the most important thing for this audience, but also just, um, you know, kind of the biggest thing that comes up when we talk about the idea of entrepreneurship. Um, I've been in this city for around 13 years now. Uh, living in New York and trying to be part of this professional industry of music and jazz and the arts. And, um, you know, I've, I have had so many moments where I have to question, is this something I want to be doing? Uh, and one of those moments, the biggest one was when I first graduated college, because you are told what to do your whole life. You know, you go to elementary school and they say, okay, get ready for middle school. We're preparing you. This is what it's gonna be like. And then when you're in middle school, the whole time they're saying, you better get ready for high school. And then they're like, you better get ready for college. And then when you're in college, even they're saying, you gotta be ready for the real world. And then all of a sudden you're in the real world. And if you're like us, you have a piece of paper that says, I'm a jazz musician <laughs> and that doesn't mean anything. And so I had this moment of, what do I do next? Um, and one of the most important things for me was saying yes to things. It's really easy to say no because you're scared or you think you're not ready or you're not good enough or whatever the reason may be. But 
uh, I was definitely one to self-sabotage myself and get in the way of those opportunities or not even see things as opportunities, not realizing that an opening would happen. And I really needed to put myself out there in that way. So, um, you know, people say, sell yourself and have confidence, but that can be really hard when you don't actually believe it. So I would say my advice in that regard is fake it till you make it say yes to something, even when you're scared out of your mind, because typically those are the things that are going to be the most beneficial for you to engage in. And not to the point where you feel like unsafe or something, but if something's just sort of like making you really nervous, those have been those moments where if I've done it and I've said yes and forced myself to go out and participate, um, a lot of good has come out of it, whether that's a musical knowledge gaining or a friendship or a connection or a job, um, things lead to things. So the, the biggest thing in New York that I've learned, and I think this goes for everywhere, but especially in New York, because there's millions of people here, um, is that whatever you put out there will come back to you a million times. And the more you put out, the more will come back. And you don't always know what it's going to look like. You can't have expectations about well, I deserve this, or I expect this to come out of this, you know, if I put the work in here, I better get this in return. It doesn't work like that. But as long as you keep trying, you keep saying yes, and you keep working hard, good things will happen. And you'll have more and more options and more and more chances to try things until you can become more picky uh, as you go. So um, I know I've talked a lot, but to get more specific, um, I, forced myself to go to jam sessions. And that was a start. And it's not the only way to start, but it was one way to start. Um, I didn't have a peer group that was super solid from my school. Um, so I had to meet a new community. And so the easiest way to do that was going to jam sessions, figuring out where those little communities were, uh, different clubs around New York City, going to hear musicians. I really like their music. You might run into somebody that you recognize from a jam session. And then you start to meet people and people start to recognize you. And if you play, people might like your music and ask you to do things outside of that, like jam sessions at people's houses or even gigs. And I would say, don't be afraid. Again, say yes. A lot of those gigs I did at first were for free. They didn't pay or it was like $40 or a drink or something like this, but it led to things like tours and recording sessions and, you know, all sorts of great things. So all of that led into real jobs. So I really, yeah, all of that to say, put yourself out there, say yes. Doesn't matter what the specifics are. It's really about the energy that you are open and that you're working hard and continuing to, to try and explore things. I agree, Roxy, thank you. That's awesome. Um, for me, I think one thing that really helped me was, you know, after finishing college at the Eastman School of Music, I had tried to keep a little bit of a log of the people that I had met or the people that I had been introduced to or connected to, whether that was, you know, somebody who came in as a guest artist to the school or maybe somebody that I met uh, who was just playing in town at a local place or whatever it might have been. And so when I did end up moving to New York, I tried to make a point to reconnect with those people somehow. And for me, that meant actually just uh, going out to see them play or to try to kind of find them like naturally, not necessarily say, hey, can I go get out to lunch with you? Can I get you a coffee? Because sometimes that, even that, which seems like it's so easy in, in New York, it can be really difficult to work, to coordinate something like that. So. Um, I actually was pretty scared of going to jam sessions, so I didn't do that. And I um, I found that this this was a different route that actually worked for me. Um, and I wish that I had had the confidence sometimes to like go out and go to all the jam sessions, but I feel like I was really lucky because I had made some great friends like Roxy and like uh, Lauren Sevian and all these other people that were so kind to kind of mentor me as I as I was navigating first moving to New York. So reconnecting with those people was really important. And so I might go to see somebody play at Dizzy's and just be hanging out and somebody would say, oh my gosh, do you live here now? And I'd say, yeah, I just moved last month. And maybe they knew me, maybe they knew my sort of quality of playing, you know, maybe they hadn't heard me in a while, but we had some type of mutual connection. Maybe my teacher was somebody that they, they knew. So they sort of trusted where I was at. And at that point, 
um, you maybe start to get those calls. Like Roxy was saying, you know, can you sub for somebody in this free rehearsal? Can you come downtown and play this last minute? You know, my tax bonus got sick or whatever it might be. And so just always being prepared um, with high quality, you know, sight reading, knowledge of tunes, knowledge of styles, being able to get along with anybody that you meet on the bandstand, being early, saying thank you, um, offering to, you know, help with what if somebody, you know, needs something, um, whatever. So um, in general, I always try to impart that even just these basic human qualities of being a good person, being easy to work with, being respectful, responsible, having good time management, good work ethic, all of this stuff that we see in businesses all over the world is still applicable to something that feels as niche and different as jazz. When I left school, when I graduated, I was very much in a place of, I knew that I, I wanted to be a musician, but I didn't exactly know what that was gonna look like. Um, fairly early on, I you know, started getting jobs and, and, and started getting called for, for tours and opportunities to travel as a sideman, you know, as a, as a sideman drummer, which is really, I mean, it's great, but it's like, that's kind of like your default I just graduated from jazz school. I'm going to go play drums with people, you know? Um, and outside of that, I knew that I wanted to do other things as well. Um, and from the onset, I was, I was kind of told that that's impossible. You know, you need to find your lane. When you graduate from school, especially, you know, graduating from from Juilliard, which, you know, I can't speak to what it is now or, you know, what what's what the ethos is there now, but you know, twelve years ago when I when I started Juilliard, it was by far the most rigid program, like this is what you're gonna do when you leave school. This is who you are and you have to put on the suit and this is what it is. Um, and I was told that kind of I needed to to just do one thing and, and be really, really great at that. And, and that's my career. Um, and I started speaking to other musicians who were, were known in many different areas. And I, I asked them, you know, how did they get there? And they told me to say yes to everything. Um, and so I kind of took that mentality and that's, that's what I started doing. You know, I, I thought for a while, I was like, man, maybe I really want to like music direct like Dave Cook, like David Cook's music directing everyone, you know, Shana Steele and like Taylor Swift and all these cool, crazy people. Like, maybe that's what I want to do. Try that out. I was like, this really isn't for me. <laughs> I don't really like this, you know? Um, maybe I want to to write this type of music. You know, I, I was cast in an off-Broadway musical. I said yes to that, you know? And when the show was moving to London to do a Western run, I was like, yeah, I don't really know if this is what I want to do. I don't want to play the same show every night, you know, four times on on matinees on the weekends. Like, I don't, I don't really think this is for me, you know. But through that opportunity, I got to meet Charlie Rosen, one of my my best friends, and through bonding with Charlie, I got to meet Stephen Feifke, also one of my best friends. And through Stephen, I got to meet Alexa. <laughs> and like, I don't know if I would have had. Um, those opportunities had I not said yes to everything um, within reason, you know? Um, and I, I think that that's, that's really important. So many young people who are graduating from, from school right now, um, they, they get tunnel vision. And I, I tell this to young people that I, that I mentor, um, students, young students of mine, like don't, don't get tunnel vision, don't, place yourself in a box at 20 years old, 21 years old, you know, um, keep yourself open, you know, keep yourself available. Um, and with that, make sure that no matter what you're taking on, that you're giving it 100% of yourself, you know, the maximum amount of honesty and, and clarity and integrity. So I, yeah, I think that was really important lesson for me to learn leaving school. I'd love to expand on some of this. And I also saw two questions in the chat that kind of relate. If we could, I, I'd just love to jump in on that. Um, Evan, your question and Alexander, your question. Um, 
what are your top sources of income and what are some of the best ways to make a living as a musician in my future? Also, uh, I've heard that a lot of musicians do gigs that aren't as enjoyable, but are much more financially viable. How do you stay successful while also doing things that are personally enjoyable and satisfying? So these are very tied to me, together for me. Um, and it also relates to what Brian was just talking about, in, in my opinion. Um, in my opinion, if you think about how can I make money, you're going about it the wrong way. You don't become a musician or especially not a jazz musician to make money. If you want to make money, I recommend that you become a capitalist investment agent, broker, something like that, um, honestly. Anything else in this life at this point is not for money. <laughs> Even being a doctor or a lawyer, nothing's for sure at this stage in our economy. Um, that being said, if you do choose this path, you don't need to feel like you have to be that suffering, starving artist. And I did believe that for a long time because I didn't have very many examples of mentors or people to look up to that were living comfortably and doing things they loved. Now I'm in a place where I'm doing that. I feel very comfortable and I'm very much enjoying what I do, but it took a lot of shimmying to get there because I didn't have a clear path of what that looked like. And I don't think anyone does. Yeah, shimmying too. Um, <laughs> but I think if I had thought about how do I make money in the beginning, I would have steered myself out of the path that ended up making me money. Only through doing what I love was I able to come to a place of actually being the best at it. And that's when you get paid. You have to be good at something. You can't just think about how do I make, get rich quick, right? Or how do I, I always say to students, like if you have a B, if you have a, a, a fallback, right, a plan B, you will do that plan B. You will do your fallback plan. So decide what you want to do and do it. Because if you decide to do something and everything you do leads to that thing, there, why would it not happen? It's going to happen, of course, if you put all your energy into it. So yes, there are gigs out there that pay $40 or one drink. And I did those. But it's, you know, you've heard of paying your dues. Mm -hmm. And in some ways you have to pay your dues because that's how you get connected to those other things, those other opportunities. Um, and like Brian said, within reason, but in my experience, if you do something once, then you know, or if you do it maybe for six years, then you'll know, then you can decide to say no to something. So one thing that I did, I did uh, like wedding gigs for a very long time, I think six years. I played in wedding bands around New York City. And when I first started, I didn't know how to play pop music. I had never played music besides jazz. Like literally, I just started with jazz. And so I was like, I sounded so bad. It was horrible. But I transcribed a book this thick of like top 40 charts for wedding band. And that taught me a lot about music, about what type of musician I want to be, human being I want to be. I met all different types of people that are not usually in the jazz world. It taught me a lot about being professional, about how to present myself as an artist. And so all of these things took me a lot of time to learn because I had never been in this world. And in the meantime, it paid really well. It paid more than the jazz gigs I was doing. And at a certain point, I realized I'm not learning those things anymore. I've gotten the lessons I need at this time out of those gigs. And now it is just for the money and it doesn't feel right anymore. I'm not enjoying it. And that's a problem. And so. It was scary to say no to that. Sometimes you have to say no, but I did. And now the amount of money I make on jazz gigs is more sometimes than the money I was making on wedding band gigs. But I wouldn't have valued myself in that way if I hadn't had that experience of actually being offered that much money for a gig that is not about jazz, right? So part of it is like saying, here's what I'm worth. This is what I deserve and bringing that to the table too. You know, if somebody says, we're going to get somebody for $50, you better take it or I'll give it to somebody else. And you think you're worth $100, then you say, okay, get that $50 musician, you know? And I guarantee you, somebody else will offer you 200 because they see you as a person who has integrity and has the value of a $100, $200 musician. I wanted to jump in on, on something Alexa said. She started talking a bit about 
some of the some specific skills, I mean, general life skills, even. Um, I was wondering if, if you or, or anyone else wanted to expand a little more on some of the non-musical skills that you have seen that have either been for you the most helpful or that you've seen in other, maybe in other people that, that have kept held them back from, from success. That's a great question. So, um, well, I think generally being able to manage your time and being able to stay organized are very important skills. And I think I think we kind of learned that, you know, if you, if from the high school to college transition, you know, once if you, if you leave home for college or you're in a similar situation where maybe it's kind of, you're more on your own, that's, or that was for me, a really great um, test of staying organized and really taking stock of what were my priorities at any given time, what did I need to get done? How long might that take me? And that in itself requires a really honest assessment of your strengths, your weaknesses, your productivity, your skill level, what you need to work on, how do you work on it? Who do you reach out to? If you need to ask for help, being comfortable asking for help. Um, so all of these things, I think just help to foster general strong relationships with people. Um, you wanna be a good team member. You wanna be a good a, a part of a community. You don't wanna be that person that's always asking for something and never offering anything. Um, so, you know, in terms of your relationships, uh, for example, maybe a recommendation letter. That's something that I think all of us have probably had to ask for, right? I always get so nervous asking people for recommendation letters, even now, um, because I don't like to be just one more thing. I don't want, I don't like to be asking somebody for one more thing. And so um, I try to keep a list of the people that I know I would appreciate a recommendation letter from. And I really don't ever want to ask anybody at the last minute. I want to be respectful of their time. So I might try to reach out a few weeks in advance and just check in, say, hi, how are you doing? And, and like, ask them, ask them what's going on, you know, no, no, fill, fill them in on your life, whatever. And then I might say, you know, I'm applying for this thing and I know things are crazy right now. I wonder if you might have time. And if they don't have time, like Roxy's saying, if they're not able to fulfill this particular request and they, are, they say no, then that leaves me enough time to get what I need maybe from somebody else, but it wasn't like putting somebody under pressure. It wasn't being disrespectful or, or, or unappreciative of somebody's time or just kind of you know saying, hey, I need this recommendation letter, can you do it? You know, Making this a, new, a more human interaction and being res uh, understanding of other people's re uh, responsibilities is really important. So that even comes down to just being on the bandstand, like Roxy's saying in, in, in the wedding bands that she played in, I'm sure, that was probably all from memory, learning the parts, you had to learn the parts. And I imagine if you get on a gig where somebody hasn't learned all their parts, it's such a drag for everybody else in the band because you can't make music. It doesn't even matter what genre we're talking about. And it's the same thing if you if you are the investment banker and you go in for a presentation and your partner hasn't done his or her research, um, that's a total bummer. So being prepared, um, all of these things, I've seen people really not be team players and it's cost them, you know, they had, they weren't, they didn't get a call back for a gig. So those are a couple of the skills. I mean, we can get into even some other ones, almost more administrative, being able to take stock of your contacts and your email newsletter and all that stuff. And that's really entrepreneurial stuff that we can get into in a bit. I would say everything Alexa just said is, is completely spot on. Um, and besides that, I mean, she, she mentioned it a couple of times about being a good person. You know, if you want to be a touring musician, um, essentially what you're saying is that you want to be a musician and, and you want to be a person who lives with other people. Like I've, I've been on bus tours where I live with the people that I play with every night, you know, and one person sleeps above me and the other person sleeps over, you know, on the other side of me and there's a person on the other end of the, you know, we're sharing a very confined space. I've been on tours where, you know, I've had to share rooms with people over the course of like two months and, you know, touring is a lot of fun. You know, it's, it's, it's got my heart. It's what I love to do most. Um, that being said, you know, you, you get sick on the road and there are, the, you know, there are those early mornings, those 5 a.m. lobby calls and the flights and the sound checks that don't go that that well. You know, you 
there are just lots of things to overcome. And if you're a person who's a drag or you don't get along with your other band members or you don't know how to be polite or courteous to people, if you're the person who's going off on the waiter at the restaurant and embarrassing the band, if you're not polite to people who want to speak to you after the show, um, no one wants to work and live with people who are not enjoyable. Um, and eventually you'll just stop getting called for tours. People won't, won't want to travel with you. So I think that's, you know, as a band leader myself, that's, that's a huge thing. There are people who, who I love and who I think they're playing is amazing, but I, I don't really want to, to tour with them because I don't want to live with them, to be honest with you, you know? So I, I think that's, that's maybe 40% of the battle right there. And then on top of that, you know, something that I had to learn really early on is like, you know, coming from the place where I, I kind of always, you know, I'm a drummer. I'm like, I feel like I'm always kind of music directing, but like knowing when it's okay to music direct and when it's not, <laughs> you know, like one, if it's not your band, that may not be the time to music direct when you're in a situation and there are, you know, there's a full orchestra on stage and, you know, three singers and it's already super chaotic. It may not be the time to be like, I think this part is, is rough, you know, that might be the time to be quiet. And then on the opposite end of that, there is a time to, to try to be helpful and, and add input. So, yeah. I'm going to jump in again, because I think there's been so many great things said and you know, flexibility keeps coming up, being flexible. You know, you have to adapt, you have to roll with the punches. And this is a, a, a life where nothing is regular. You don't have nine to five Monday through Friday. So you have to be able to adjust to things. And like Brian said, challenges happen on the road, on the bandstand. Um, the other thing that keeps coming up is, you know, being a good person. And I just wanna say like outside of music, one of the things I've worked most on practicing is self-help or self-improvement or psychology, going to therapy, reading books, all these concepts around how do I be a better person, whether that's working on my organizational skills, my punctuality, you know, my health, whether that's physical or mental health. Um, these things are very important because not only is it who you're hanging out with on tour, but you are your product. So as a musician, your music is you and you are your product. And so when you show up to a gig, people see you before they hear you, you know, they know, like, did the person show up? They say showing up is half the battle. So if showing up is half the battle and being a good person is 40% of it, that leaves 10% for music, right? So it's very important to be somebody, the type of person who's constantly trying to be better, you know, growing, We've all made lots of mistakes on this call. We're, we're very close friends. Alexa and I've lived together on the road. And you know the important part is that you keep trying. And I wanna go back to something I said, when you're like, if we're thinking about money, there's situations where you have to say no because I've had this situation and Alexa knows, you stop enjoying it so much that you become a worse person. And so if you, are not being a good person in that situation, you're actually ruining your chances of getting more gigs, of succeeding, of getting paid. Your reputation is worth a lot and your connections and your relationships. And so if you feel like you're not in a position to bring your best self, sometimes that's when you have to say no to things. And, and again, I, I, I just see all these questions about how to make money. And I just think it's really, you have to feel good. <laughs> you can't be focused on how it's gonna work out. Cause I, you know, if you are, you're going to be so worried about it. You're going to ruin it <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, yeah. So to what Roxy's saying, I totally agree. I think that's a really great point. And it's not even something that I even, I don't think I actually like consciously articulated it in my mind, but you know, when, yeah, when you have something on your calendar and you're kind of like, Ugh, I'm not looking forward to that. It's that feeling. Um, so thank you, Roxy, for helping me put that into perspective. And I'm sure many people on the call. One thing I wanted to maybe add in or sort of transition to is that there are so many different ways to make a living in music, to make a life in music. Um, so you might be performing, you might be teaching and just inside of those opportunities alone, those sort of fields alone, there are many, many, many different things. We heard 
you know, you could decide to be a pit musician, somebody that plays and tours with shows. You could be a studio musician out in on the West Coast. You could, which maybe isn't as as big of a field as it was years ago, but you know, you could work in film and TV. You could decide to work in a, you know, perhaps you really love avant-garde music and that's all you want to play. On the education side of things, you could be a nine to five or really like a seven to five public school educator. You could be a college educator. You could be a private studio instructor. You could be, you know, an early childhood music teacher where you work with groups of young kids on the weekends with parents in your community at like a community center. There are many, many, many different ways. And you could even teach different subjects. If you're good with technology and you like to build websites, you could teach, you know, in an entrepreneurial department at a music school. You could even start your own business as a web designer, maybe specifically for artists. You could do many other things specifically for artists. You could work in graphic design and maybe you work for a particular magazine in music, or maybe you work for a particular festival or venue. Maybe you are a performer, but you like sound and you want, you want to also do sound engineer or set design. There are so many different things like in the whole ecosystem of jazz and, and music um, where if you have other passions, there may be a way to fuse them. And that can really help to create almost like a doubly fulfilling life for you. So I would really, I, I don't want to like discourage anyone from being interested in other things because for me, what I'm really interested in, I knew I was interested in saxophone, but also I loved playing clarinet and flute. So that became a part of a part of my product. I also really love teaching at like any level most of the time. So that became a product. And then I also really love leadership. Like I love like organizational leadership. And I also love um, just like productivity and wellness. And so like th those have become a part of my product. Um, if I was good or better with technology and really into it, I probably would maybe do more things over there, but we're all very different. And so I would say, make a list of what really interests you, make a list of the people that you see out there and what they're doing. What about it do you like? What about it would you change? I think it's really exciting to sort of put on paper like your dream life and your dream career and then find ways to make it happen by putting sort of actionable items under each of those dreams to see how can you get there. And like Roxy's saying, if you are so, 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 so focused on the end product that you're totally pigeonholed, you might end up accidentally uh, saying no to things that would have actually helped. So staying open-minded is really important, um, but I think it's always a great idea. I, I kind of do this, I do it every month, but I do a larger version of this, like at the new year or on New Year's, making a list of everything I did in the year. What was I proud of? What was I not proud of? Who did I work with? Who did I not work with that I really want to work with? So we can all do this at any level of our study. What did you learn that you loved? What do you still need to practice? Um, and kind of create your own, your own world out of it. Yeah, I, I think the three of us, we, we have really unique uh, careers because we're, we're into so many different things. Um, I couldn't think of like, you know, two other people to, to be on a panel with where it's just like our, our careers are very similar in a lot of ways. We're all touring musicians. We all have organizations and nonprofits that we lead, but also they're just so varied in terms of, of everything that we do. Um, yeah, I, I kind of want to jump into some of the school questions that I'm, that I'm seeing. Um, I am not currently affiliated with the university, so I have no problems being very, very blunt <laughs> and very real when uh, answering these questions because no one's writing me a check currently. Um, in terms of, of school, um, I, I always get the question, do I have to move to New York? to go to school, to be in jazz school. Um, I think that this question is, is super important. I think it's very individual. For me, coming out of high school, one, when I, when I graduated high school, I graduated high school in 2008, um, in the summer of 2008, right before the market crash. So when I graduated high school, there was just like, Every school is like, yeah, you can come for, to school for free. That's that's awesome. Yeah, you know, oh sure, we'll give you a, how big of a scholarship do you need? Yeah, sure, we got you. I mean, at that time, 
if you, when I was in high school, when you got into Grammy band, you were automatically accepted to like seven schools or something. And they all had nice scholarship programs, or scholarship uh, packages waiting for you. So coming to New York for me at that time, uh, that made a lot of sense because it wasn't a huge financial burden. And I felt like I was, for at least for a, a young student musician, I was at a level where I wouldn't shoot myself in, in the foot by coming. Um, and also I was able to make connections with other musicians around me who were my age and older. Um, that being said, if I had to, if I were given that choice to come to New York um, in 2020, knowing that I would go like $200,000 plus into debt, would I still do it? The answer is probably no, I, I wouldn't think it was worth it. So I, I think it's a very, uh, personal question it, it really it really depends on your, your motivations why you want to come to New York if you want to come to New York just to come to New York then maybe that's not the answer if you if you're coming to study with a specific teacher maybe you can speak to that teacher and you can find other ways to study with them um, I think that almost any conservatory almost any music school that that you go to, there are, are lessons to be learned and, and things to be taken away uh, from those programs. Um, and I think that there's always time, especially if you're 19 years old, 18 years old, I think there's always time, you know, after your bachelor's to, to explore those options um, that are available to you in New York City. But, you know, it, it, was a wonderful experience for me. I, I, you know, got to meet a lot of people. I, I, it helped my career. You know, after four years of undergrad, I decided that I was done with school. I didn't, I didn't need a master's. I didn't need a, a, a PhD or a DMA. Um, so yeah, that's just my own personal view, my own personal opinion on school. And Alexa and Roxy may have differing opinions about that. I very much agree. Um, and I, you know, I went to William Patterson thinking I was coming from Seattle and I thought that's as close as I can get to New York City, but also had a full scholarship. And in the end, even though it did get me adjusted to the city before moving into the city, because I got to move to New Jersey like 20 minutes from the city first, um, ultimately it was comparable to going to any great state school or you know conservatory program outside of New York uh, in that the experience was when I moved to New York after graduating I had to start from scratch so even though I got to study with some of the teachers from New York City like Harold Mayburn and Rich Perry and people like that um, the actual peer network had to start over so I feel like I did start over and so you know if I did it you can do it um, but I do think I'm very grateful that I graduated with no debt. That was very important to being able to say yes to all those things I said yes to. Because if I had a big mountain of debt trying, you know, trying to pay that off, I might have made different decisions about what I say yes and no to. And I didn't really want that to dictate my musical experiences. So I was fortunate to have that option. And I think there's many ways to go about it. You could get your master's in New York or you can move there without going to school there. You know, there's many ways to do it, but I would say that the students who are in New York City now um, do have a little bit of a shortcut, fast forward button in terms of the networks that they have. Alexa and Brian both went to Juilliard and I see, you know, my husband went to Juilliard. I see that the gigs that they get now continue to be, if they want, out of that network from Juilliard, whether it was the students that they were in school with or their teachers or people hearing about them going to that school. Um, so there is, it, the, the real thing is that it's one big community, that musicians are a community, a network. And so having access to that is what's important, but it's not important when you gain access to it. It's, there's a million ways to do it. And it, it ties back into something I just wanted to add on what we were talking about before, some of these other questions in the chat as well. Um, Zeke asking about conducting, um, William asking about finding your niche, um, I think that, you know, really the three of us, Brian has said this many times, are very diversified. And that means we do many different things well. 
And so our niches, I would guesstimate that none of us found our niche. We created something that became the Brian niche, the Alexa niche, the Roxy niche. Um, I created my band, I created my organization, uh, I created my opportunities based on what I love. And Alexa was talking about this too. It's like, you do need to be good at more than music, but you don't need to be good at what I'm good at or what Brian's good at or what Alexa's good at. So find what you're good at and what you love to do, that's your niche. But it's not gonna be one, like, here's my niche, I found it. It's ever evolving. It's gonna be a conglomeration of many things that make you you. And it's just like jazz. The, th the best thing about jazz that I love is that we want all these different voices. So that doesn't just go for the music. It goes for the way you make a career, the way you're contributing to the community. And that might be through performing, teaching, recording. But I don't think any of us have said to ourselves, I'm going to do this instead of this. You know, Brian does conduct, but he doesn't do it instead of performing. His conducting and performing inform one another. So I don't think, especially as a young person, you want to cut yourself off to these opportunities. And like Brian said, try it out. You're going to know <laughs> once you try something if it's for you, but that doesn't mean you have to say no to all this other stuff. And I would say every performer I know, 99% of jazz performers are educators, but not all educators are active performers. So if performance is something you're really interested in, don't cut yourself off from that option just because you think you need to teach. Because you can teach if you're a performer. That's part of the legacy of being a jazz musician is passing on the information as a performer. This sort of brings me to Jameson's question about a normal daily routine. Um, so what Roxy's saying is, you know, every day could be different. Each day, I mean, in COVID, it's a different story now. But before, I think I can speak for all of us when I say, you know, every week was definitely different. It's not the same as when you're you know, doing that nine to five job. And so for you, if you really like that, this might be a different, this lifestyle may be a little bit jarring, but as we're saying, you know, uh, there are options for that lifestyle in the world of music, but I think um, I can speak for myself in terms of my daily routine. I actually like to get up somewhat early. I like to go to bed somewhat early, like midnight or, or, or earlier. I'm, I never really liked the whole like, hang out till 3 or 4 a.m. and then sleep till noon because I always just felt kind of, I just didn't feel so good when I did it. And it just didn't work for me. And so that's okay. I always joke that I'm kind of like not the, the stereotypical jazz musician, but hey, what can you do? Um, I think for me, I like to get my practicing done in the morning. If I, you know, if I had a gig to get to a rehearsal, I just try to do everything in the morning so that the, the afternoon and the evening would be available for all that stuff. And now that we're in COVID, it's different. You know, um, I might do some more playing in the afternoon. Maybe I'll have some lessons to teach on Zoom in the mornings. Uh, honestly, every day is still kind of different, even though I, I'm just at home shuffling around in my slippers. But um, it seems that every day still appears to be different. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> you're welcome to add your, your schedules. I would like the hourly breakdown, please. <laughs> yeah, it's always different. And, and you know, somebody asked, Elijah asked, how do you balance home and family life versus travel? I think it ties into this question. Um, it's always changing. And what I found for me isn't gonna necessarily work for everyone, but I have found in my life that uh, balance doesn't come on a daily basis. It comes, in bigger chunks of time. So I might have a week or a month where I'm practicing only super intensely. And then a week or a month where I don't even have one moment to practice. Um, and so my, my idea of balance has come differently in more uh, concentrated parts. You know, I visit my family in Seattle for a couple of weeks, you know, every year, every six months and see family. My husband and I both tour. So our time together is very intense in terms of we'll see each other 
for a week and then we won't see each other for five weeks. So we're going to spend more time together during that one week than we would in a normal married couple life, right? Um, in terms of practicing and composing, it's the same way. I, I might be super into composing for a month in the summer and then not do it for the next six months. But I think other people I have heard try to do like a daily ritual, you know, compose 10 minutes a day at the beginning, come back to it an hour later in the day, practice for two hours before they do a run every day. So you're going to have to find what works for you. But I think like Alexa said, it's important to understand if you're considering performance in this, in jazz, it's going to look different every day and every week, especially. Um, and you might find little chunks of time, like a couple of months here or there, where you get a regular routine, like you're doing a show uh, and you have a daily schedule or you're doing two, two weeks at this jazz club or, you know, go to Doha or <laughs> all these things that we've done um, provide structure for a, a short period of time. But in the long run, everything changes. And that goes back to the flexibility that we talked about earlier on. No hourly breakdown, Brian. <laughs> um. No, I am a person who has never, ever uh, kept a normal sleep schedule. I'm someone who, um, I, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't keep a schedule, so to speak. Uh, I think that's one of the things that attracts me so much to being a musician, uh, knowing that I'm going to wake up in a different time zone, knowing that I'm going to have uh, different assignments. Um, my week this week is like I'm, I'm building and producing tracks for CBS while arranging and putting together orchestrations for uh, for an event or for, or for a I don't know what you want to call it for a video shoot thing on Friday. Um, so like I wake up in the morning and I write until I can't write anymore and I'll stop to do a Zoom webinar with Jazz St. Louis. Um, and after this, I'll write until uh, 2 a.m. and then I'll sleep until 11 and then I'll get up and rinse repeat until I'm done. Um, whereas like last week looked very different for me. Last week was much more perform. I was making videos for different people and I had a gig at Smalls and, you know, so it, it's, it changes um, so much. In terms of practicing, um, being a drummer on the road, it's almost impossible to practice. Like you can play you know, on your practice pad in the airport or uh, at the hotel in the morning. But, you know, there's, it's it's very seldom um, that you'll walk downstairs to the hotel lobby and there'll be a, a drum kit, <laughs> you know, or like the clubs in, you know, inside the hotel and there's a drum kit for you to practice, you know, and every now and again, you'll have that, that sort of luxury. But most of the time, you won't have access to a kit. Um, and in terms of my, my days generally uh, pre-pandemic, it's like I knew that when I was home, that was the opportunity and that was the time that I would schedule and allow myself to to have long practice sessions um, because I won't receive those on the road. Um, I, I kind of want to tie in two of these questions. I, I saw the, I don't know where it went, the question about conducting and then also, it's directed at Roxy, but I'm going to start the conversation and uh, we can all come back to it, how to put your own band together. Um, I, I think that, I, I talked about this the last, I think in one of the previous sessions um, where I was writing and I, I wanted to write for orchestra and I started sending arrangements and orchestrations to uh, different vocalists. I, I mailed some to Kurt Elling and I mailed some to Diane Reeves and you know I was trying to get them to play and record my music because I knew that they had orchestral shows. Um, that they that they booked, and I couldn't get them to do it. I was playing with Kurt Elling at the time, and I still couldn't get him to <laughs> play one of my arrangements with an orchestra, because the programming happens so far in advance, or so you know so far in advance. Um, when I asked John Clayton about this, he was like, "Well, man, just start your own orchestra." And I was like, "I can't do that." And he was like, "Why not?" <laughs> I was like, I, "I don't know, because you can't." Um, you know, chances are in jazz music. Um, no one, I mean, if, if so, it's very limited. No one's going to offer for you to come conduct their music or, you know, that's just not, and maybe you're the person to, uh, 
to create that for for yourself. But I, I, I think that most of the time, if you want to conduct, um, it comes from a place of one, having your own ensemble and two, uh, conducting your own music. You know, we look at the career of someone like, you know, Rich Rosa or like Vince Mendoza, you know, they've created careers for themselves where they conduct their own music. Um, a big band that Alexa and I both play in called the Stephen Feifke Big Band. Stephen doesn't <laughs> Stephen doesn't play piano in his own band. Usually, he's generally up there conducting. Sometimes with on Halloween with the uh, the air traffic control um, cones thing, light things that you know you have. Um, and so I, I think that that's um, that's an easier path to to conducting. And, and in terms of how you start your own band, how you put your own band together. Um, you get together with some friends, maybe with a person or two who's, who you look up to and you ask them to, to start a band. You ask them to, you find, you get a gig and you ask them to play a gig with you. Um, with my own band, I think that, you know, we've gone through several uh, permeations of, of my own band. You know, we've, they've looked very different in terms of uh, who's in it and, and how figuring out like what the what the balance is like what I, I think that everyone brings something unique to the band um, and the only way that you you learn how to do that is is just by doing it I'm gonna pass it off to Roxy because it was her question <laughs> uh, you said a lot of what I would say and I think um, I would just add that you know putting your own band together just know that it's very challenging because you're gonna be not only organizing, but your musical directing, you're dealing with personalities. So you're a coach, uh, you're a friend, you're a leader, and you're a musician. So then you still have to get up there and play unless, you know, like Brian said, you're just conducting. Uh, I shouldn't say just because that's also its own beast. But um, for me as a saxophonist, uh, I knew I wanted to be playing the saxophone. I knew I wanted to be performing my composition. So I have to be a now saxophonist, uh, a performer, entertainer, an artist, a composer, and then you have to have somewhere to play. So you have to be a booking agent, you have to be a manager, uh, you have to be in charge of your own marketing, you have to have people interested in what you're doing in order to want to book you and in order to want to come to your show, you've got to promote that, so you've got to sell tickets. Um, there's a lot of these skills that I just learned. I put, I made my own website, you know, I do my social posts and all that stuff, but all that came a lot later. I started my band by calling my friends, putting some charts together and just asking them to play. And I've had a lot of no's. And so I think the most important thing about being a band leader is persistence. And I cannot repeat this enough, understate, underscore it enough because I've had a lot of friends come to me and say, how did you get a gig at Smalls or the Jazz Standard? Or how'd you get, on this record label or that. And my only answer is persistence. I didn't let no be the answer. You just keep asking, you keep asking. How do you get so-and-so to play on your record? Keep asking, you know? So it's the same thing as becoming a great musician. You have to keep practicing until you get that lick, right? So it's the same thing with band leading. You just have to practice those skills and try something, put yourself out there. We come full circle to the first thing I said today. You know, put yourself out there, keep trying and be open and, and say yes. And just, you'll, you'll learn what you need to learn, but you, you'll never get there if you don't do something. So you have to start. Sort of pulling from one of the questions that uh, one of our students asked about, and he was asking specifically about um, the impact on jazz clubs and how they think that'll change the landscape. But as, as musicians, how do you think your careers will change and your day to day might change as we you know look to come out of this pandemic with vaccines on the horizon what do you think might be different on the back end especially for all of our students who are just starting to, their careers i don't know if i have the answers but i i think you know we all this week are very sad um to have learned that the jazz standard has has closed that was i think one of all of our favorite places here in new york and so i think it's really important um if there's anything any of us can do to help support the venues and the organizations in our area um, now is the time 
I think, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of anticipating that 2021 is going to be a little bit of a wash for us because as Brian was saying, things book almost a year in advance. And so, and plus we, we have really, we put really large groups of people together most of the time. So it's hard to, to imagine that people will want to be squished into an underground jazz club with a hundred strangers. Um, so I think we have all pivoted online, teaching online, master classes online, um, working on recording online. And I think for anybody that's just starting their careers, it's fortunate and unfortunate to have to dive into all that technology. I think it's really easy to get bogged down with it and overwhelmed with it, but the, the more skills that you can gather up, the better. So getting an understanding of what microphones work best for you on your instrument. And that can help you when you go to play in live settings too. Um, having an understanding of how to use excuse me, specific recording software. Um, I'm a little hungry. I'm getting a little uh, loopy over here. Um, specific recording software, which can help you in your home or when you're in a real rec recording studio, like live with actual humans. Um, social media, also important. Website, also important. Not, you know, not the be all end all, but I think these are the things that we can all, at least I'm trying to, you know, for students that are trying to get out there and really make it, as they say, this is a good time to focus on all those things that we might not get to in that regular touring life. Yeah, I, I want to add something to this too. I have a, a couple things. The first thing is, if you're like done with high school or done with college, don't move to New York right now. This is not the time. People, we're, we're leaving New York. Like this is not the time to come meet everybody. Like honestly, wait a year at least because New York will be here. But at the same time, um, you know, Brian was saying he graduated high school in 2008. I graduated college in 2008. And guess what? There were no gigs. So it wasn't the same as a pandemic, but people who had told me they had a whole career of working four gigs a day, including recording sessions, now had zero gigs a day. So how is somebody like me, who was at the time 22 year old college grad gonna get any gigs when all the like top call musicians in the world are not gigging? So what this taught me now that I've come out the other side of that is it is actually a benefit in some ways for those of you who are just starting out because you don't have to relearn you get to just learn. It's just going to be what it is. When you start your career, you're starting from scratch and it's going to be, you know, it's going to be what it is. So you get to learn as everybody else has to relearn and readjust. Regardless if a vaccine comes now or in the spring, jazz clubs sometimes book three years in advance. So this industry is going to take a while to rebound. Even if we were all vaccine, vaccinated tomorrow, jazz would not be back tomorrow and New York will not be New York tomorrow. So I urge you to, to exercise patience. Um, on that note, one of my students asked, what do we have to look forward to? And I think that one big point I wanna make is that these times in history are followed by times of great art and people will need art more than ever when we come out of this. People are going to pay for art. They're going to pay. They're, they're, they need art, right? People are depressed. They're isolated. Jazz is community. Jazz is gathering together and celebrating each other. So I know we will come out of this, but we do need to be patient. Um, it kind of relates to somebody asking about, do you need to live in a big city in order to be a successful musician? Or can you still live in a place like non St. Louis, Missouri? Um, I think that, you know, music, like any field, if you want to be great at it, you need to immerse yourself in that thing. So if you're in a community where you're immersed in music, whatever type of music you want to play, that's great. But my guess is that if you're in non St. Louis, Missouri, you're not immersed in jazz, if jazz is your love and you're going to outgrow that quickly. Now that doesn't mean that you have to live in New York your whole life, right? You can live in Missouri and make a living being a musician. 
However, if you're trying to learn a language, right, you're going to go to the country where that language is spoken because you need to immerse yourself in that language. And the same is true for jazz. So if you can get to New York or somewhere where you feel like your opportunities are greater than what you know already, that's what I urge you to do. Now, of course, that being said with COVID, patience, but, <laughs> but I think, you know, once you've established your own career in yourself, you can do, you can move anywhere. We've seen this in the, the jazz greats that we look up to, but in the meantime, if you're still trying to learn and grow as a musician, you want to be surrounded by people who inspire you and push you uh, to be your best self and, and push you in directions that you wouldn't be able to be pushed otherwise. I'm sure these guys have something to say on that too. Yeah, I think you just you just covered it all, Roxy. Um, if if you are dead set on moving to New York right now, I think that you should move to New York, understanding the limitations uh, that are in place um, currently, and the the climate that you're moving into. Um, I think now more than ever is a a great time to be a student because you don't have to uh, take on some of the responsibilities that, that Alexa, Andy, Roxy, and I are, are, are dealing with uh, at this current moment. I understand that it, it sucks with, with the Zoom class and Zoom school, but um, I would really spend the time as a student right now, uh, take advantage of the time that you have to dive into some of these other skills. Um, in, terms of, of Liam, in terms of Liam's question um, about production and, and, and being a, a hip hop and, and Pop producer, um, I went to school with you know Jahan Sweet, who you know was nominated for like two Grammys this year, one for working with Beyonce and the other I can't remember who the other ones for, um, but you know he was a student at Juilliard learning jazz piano. Um, there's a, a great episode of, of Genius where he uh, where he breaks down like one of the songs he he wrote for a Boogie with a Hoodie, Boogie with a Hoodie, um, that Drowning song. And he's like, the way that, you know, normally when you watch the episodes, like the way that they normally go is the producers are like, yeah, and then I hit this button and it was like, boom. And I was like, yeah, that's fire. Boom, boom, you know. And Jahan sits there and he like folds his legs and he was like, yeah, I, I thought that I wanted to start with p this piano intro and I immediately thought of Satie's Gymnopathy number one. And I'm like, you know, the people who are interviewing him are just like, what? <laughs> He's like, when I was at Juilliard, I really got into the Bach masses. And it's like, what are you talking about? You know, so I, I think that, again, that no matter what school you go to, there are, are things to learn. Um, and Jude's question about music business and, and recording music, um, no matter where you go to school, you're, you're going to, if you want to be a musician, you're going to have to learn about music business. Like Roxy just said, we're publicists, we're, we're agents, we're marketing directors, we're accountants. We have to take care of so many different elements. It's not just playing our instruments. Um, we, we have to do so many jobs and wear so many hats to make sure that we're, we're paying our band and make sure that we're able to, to take care and provide for ourselves, making sure that people are coming to our shows. Um, I, I think that the reason you go to a school is to uh, be a part of a community. And I think that there's more than one way to join that community. So if you want to be a producer and you know you can't be around people right now or you, you aren't able to access schools, then maybe try interning at a studio. Like that's a great way to learn production. Work for someone, ask someone if, if you can just do melodyne vocals for them. Maybe I can, I can chop up vocals for you. That's something that I hate doing. You know, if a, if a young person was like, hey man, can I melodyne vocals, background vocals for you and, and clean them up and, and edit them for you? I'd be like, yeah, sure. And then I would tell them what they're doing wrong. You know, um, if you want to get into music business, look at internships. There are, are plenty of musicians who need interns right now. There are plenty of, of different nonprofits and organizations that need interns right now. Um, we're always looking for help. People, you know, to send emails and, and by doing that, you'll make those connections with other musicians and other people in the business and marketplace. Just a couple other uh, quick questions that we have in the chat. Do, 
you know, what role have teachers and mentors played for in your development as musicians and, and, and as professionals too? Um, I think for all of us, we've had very many experiences with different jazz mentors and educators. I think all of us probably had an educator that really inspired us and really made us feel like we could do this. And then maybe we met people that we didn't really click with so much. And I think we learned on both sides. At least I know I have. I learned what type of educator I wanted to be and what type of educator I didn't want to be. And so they both were really good experiences. I can say for myself personally, I was really fortunate to have teachers who were really invested in, in, you know, helping me gather all the tools that I needed to succeed and to get into a music conservatory and to be as prepared as possible. And they also were just great examples of people and, you know, community oriented citizens and selfless humans and people who were in it for the music and the, for the beauty of music. And again, not in it for necessarily money or fame or anything like that um and so i really try to always give those people credit and i always try you know if there is even a mentor or a role model of mine that helped me out that got lunch with me and gave me advice or that threw me a free rehearsal gig or anything like that i try to whenever i have the opportunity to hire a guest artist or to give a recommendation or to have a guest on a gig i try to give back and kind of pay it forward and um, thank those people with, with any opportunity that I can. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, in this music, I said this, you know, as a, on the other side, I was talking about performers being educators and that, you know, that's part of the lineage of jazz, but on in this way as well, right? So every jazz musician is a student for life and also a teacher for life. And so I think all of us have just had uh, most of our important musical experiences and, and the ones that shaped us as artists and performers and professionals have come from our mentors, um, but also our peers can be our mentors sometimes. Um, one thing I think would be a bit of advice would be, don't be afraid to ask questions. I was very afraid to ask my mentors questions because I didn't know what to ask or I didn't know how things worked but those are the moments you can ask right so like i learned a lot from working with jeremy pelt's band because he was his own band leader and he booked his tours and did all of that stuff and sometimes it's the things that you don't know that you're going to end up learning like i ended up learning how to shape a set list or how to announce how do i want to announce my band members or the names of the songs you know little things that i had never thought about but once you see somebody do it in a way that you like or even don't like that helps shape shape it but you can ask questions too you can say like why did you make this decision and you might get, gain a lot of insight um and sometimes it's easier to ask our friends questions our peers so i would say don't be afraid to ask questions that can help with mentorship awesome well i i want to say a big thank you to um all three of our awesome panelists tonight um, Roxy, Brian, and Alexa, thank you so much for being with us. Um...